As a clinician and over the last few years as a nutrition coach, I get clients who come to me with digestive issues, bloating in the tummy, difficulty remembering things, disturbances in their sleep, vague aches and body pains, sometimes anxiety and depression, migraines. Now, all of these seem to be different problems which are not related to one another. And often the person goes from one specialist to another in order to get treatment for it. The fact is, that they may all be related to gut health. Now, when we talk about gut health, what do we mean? Our gut means our intestines, and gut health involves the whole digestive system, right from when food enters to our body till all the waste products are eliminated. That is right from the tongue till the anus. Now, when we talk about gut health, it means the health of this microbiome that exists within the gut. This microbiome comprises bacteria, fungi, virus, and also protozoa. If the microbiome is healthy, then our gut is healthy. If our gut is healthy, then we are healthy. In fact, in India, the land of Ayurveda, any Ayurvedic practitioner will tell you that if the gut is good, then everything else is good. So a disturbance in the gut microbiome where sometimes harmful bacteria or harmful fungi may have entered the microbiome, it is called dysbiosis. And today that's what we are going to discuss, dysbiosis. Welcome to the Wellberry. I'm Dr. Nirmala. And today with us, we have Alessandra Ginsberg, who is a functional nutritionist from Switzerland. Together, we will be talking about dysbiosis, why it occurs, and what can be done about it. If you find this information helpful, then please do share it with somebody. Go ahead and hit that subscribe button so that you'll get notifications every time we come out with a new video. Before the discussion with Alexandra, I'd like to remind you that these videos are only for information purpose. They are not a medical consultation. If you have any of these problems that we are discussing here, do consult with a doctor or a nutrition coach. You can reach me by email and I will be adding the email address in the description area. So without further delay, let's welcome Alex to the Wellberry. Hi, Alex. Welcome to the Wellberry. It's so good to have you here again with us. Hi, Nimi. Nice to be back. Um, uh, I'm fine. I hope you're well too. And um, we have dysbiosis today to talk about, right? Yes. Yeah, so let's jump right into the discussion. Uh, Alex, what do we mean by dysbiosis? I mean, it's uh, it's a word that we hear going around a lot, especially with all the discussions about gut health. But what does it mean? Dysbiosis, um, to make it simple, is an imbalance or a change um, in the composition of the microbiota. And you know that the microbiome is what we is the bugs that we have in our uh, gut, especially in the large intestine. So we talk about dysbiosis when there is a change uh, in this uh, composition. When you say a change okay. in the composition, uh... Do you want to elaborate on what the microbiota is like? Yeah, the microbiota is a population of microorganisms like bacteria and uh, uh, aerobic uh, or microorganisms that uh, fungi that live in our gut. And um, they're also considered like a new organ because it's been discovered. It's been not so much discovered lately, but it's been a lot of clinical studies have been uh, concentrating on the role of the microbiota in the last 10, 15 years. And um, it has been it has appeared that it has a very important role in our health for various reasons, which we'll uh, um, discover later. And um, so it is a population, as I said, of microorganisms. Organisms. And there are 100,000 times more of those than of our human cells in the body. So it's varies. We're talking about trillions. Um, and um, they are diverse. They come from different strains. And um, so there is not a, a particular um, composition of the microbiome. It, there is the, the, the microbiome depends from it's really per, uh, particular and um, uh, individual from one person to the other. It is very different and it is influenced by our lifestyle 
lifestyle, by our environment, by everything from day one of our birth. So you can imagine how different it can be from one person to the other. Um, and there are different strains. There are main strains like, like with lactobacillus bacillus and bifido uh, bacteria that people have probably already heard of, but there are many more. And there is also uh, some that have not yet been uh, uncovered. So it is ongoing. Mm. And uh, what we know is that the central role of the microbiota is really important to our health, not only our digestion, by our metabolic health, our cardiovascular health, our brain health, etc. So it does um, cohabit with us. And uh, and they need um, to be in good shape. The microorganisms need that we have a proper diet and we need them to be in proper health to be able to uh, perform um, their role of uh, fermenting what we eat and of producing uh, uh, metabolites like short fatty chain, short chain fatty acids that in turn are uh, contribute to our health. So the microbiome is... Um, part of our body it's uh, there are alive microorganisms they are in our large intestine and they have a fundamental role uh, in keeping us healthy so when they are not very balanced when there is some something happens uh, a trauma an improper diet uh, a course of medication something that uh, uh, interferes with a normal life and it's a trauma either physical or psychological we can have what we said uh, before a dysbiosis so a change in composition which is an imbalanced um, now composition of the microorganism that results okay it's very interesting what you were just talking like every person has a different kind of microbiome in fact i remember uh, when we were studying the course together, they spoke about mm -hmm. it as being as unique as a fingerprint. Each person's microbiome is as unique as a fingerprint. And we would never think of that uh, normally, isn't it? So when, yeah, a person, absolutely. when a person has dysbiosis, what in your experience are the kind of complaints or the kind of health related problems that they have? Okay, so the symptoms, the most common ones is certainly fatigue, chronic fatigue, uh, an impaired digestion, and with impaired digestion comes an impaired absorption very often, uh, food intolerances, uh, constipation, gas, bloating, diarrhea, um, even skin rashes and acne and psoriasis uh, can appear. Uh, you can have, obviously, it's a form of inflammation in the gut. So it can um, manifest itself in different parts of the body. So as I mentioned, in the digestive tract, but also on the skin. Um, a weight gain, it can also lead to weight gain and insulin resistance. Um, uh, and when it is uh, um, continuous, it's it continue, continues and it's not treated it can lead to a leaky gut and there you can have an open door to all another series of symptoms like for example of more heavy things like an ulcerative ulcerative colitis atherosclerosis um autoimmune conditions like hashimoto so, or um, you could have uh, rheumatoid arthritis, for example, and IBS, IBD, asthma. So it really um, is something that needs to be addressed when it uh, manifests itself because it can lead to a leaky gut and the leaky gut can even lead to a leaky brain with anxiety, depression and other neurological manifestations. So when you... So, yeah. So when you talk about leaky gut, what you're saying, I think what you're trying to explain is that our intestines have a lining, a membranous lining, and uh, they also have a lot of mucus, which is food for this microbiome. And when our gut health is not yes. good, what happens is that th this membrane, the continuity in the membrane is broken. This membrane is supposed to be like a you know, a lace or a net which is really connected and then that gets broken, leading to uh, nutrients which should be staying within the intestines, actually then going out of that space, isn't it? And uh, that's what you mean by leaky gut. Yes, yes, as you say correctly, we have one, just one layer of cells, of enterocytes, of uh, intestines 
intestinal cells and then this thick mucus lining protecting us. And this is just the barrier that we have from our gut. So everything that we eat from the exterior world and our internal body, the rest of the body. So um, this uh, lining is uh, extremely important, but also fragile. Alex, when we talk about leaky gut, when we talk about dysbiosis, why does this happen? It happens, okay, why does dysbiosis happen? Um, dysbiosis happens because um, we, for various reasons, one of the first causes of dysbiosis is uh, lifestyle and habits and the, the fact that we have a Western diet that is high in sugar and low in fiber because our microbiome feeds itself on the fiber that we do not digest. As you know, vegetables and fruits have, uh, are uh, rich in fiber. Their outer layer is rich in fiber. And we cannot digest this uh, layer, of which is present in the vegetables and in the fruits mainly. But the microorganisms in our gut, they eat and they feed themselves on that. So that is why it is important for us to eat vegetables and fruits, because we're feeding our bugs and uh, if they're fed they're healthy and they are um, diverse so mm -hmm. when we don't when we are on a, a western diet we are not feeding them uh, very well because the western diet i mean high sugar and um, as i said low fiber and processed foods and things like that mm -hmm. uh, lifestyle habits as i said also can impact it for example stress and uh, poor sleep a lot of alcohol consumption, medications impact it too. Uh, for example, antibiotics or um, anti-inflammatory non-steroid drugs impact it negatively. Um, an environment also, if we're in an environment that is, uh, we're not uh, you know, enough outside uh, in contact with nature and uh, in relaxing and taking the time really to, to, to a little bit focus and, and try to, to relax. These are situations that impact negatively the microbiome. When it is negatively impacted, the, the gut lining suffers too because they are these microbiomes live on the mucus that is around our uh, the lining of our gut so the lining of our gut is a, a series of one layer of cells of intestinal cells and mucus and then we have the microbiome that is actually there near the mucus and this barrier this mucus and this line of cells they actually are very important because they separate our body from what if we eat and from the exterior part uh, of our of our body so you know that from the mouth to the anus that's the exterior part of our body so everything that we ingest actually is um is pro this does not get in contact with the rest of our body because of this mucus and this one layer of cells so it is very important that this is um if you want uh, impermeable so it doesn't does not leak we get a leaky gut if we don't have a proper lifestyle um and if we um thus do not um if you want feed the microbiome microorganisms because the microorganisms if they are not fed by our diet because we do not have a diet rich in fiber they actually start feeding themselves on the mucus lining of our gut so in other words it's like they are eating our our own body you know the lining of our intestinal barrier is being eaten by our bugs so you understand the importance of having a fiber rich diet yeah. and when they start eating the mucus well they are nearing the only only layer of cells okay. that is left between the gut and the body yes yes so when uh, I've seen a lot of clients with gut related issues over the past few years, and one of the things that I have noticed while uh, talking to them, while coaching them is that many of them have anxiety issues. Uh, some of them have uh, depression. Uh, there's obviously a lot of sleep disturbance or um, maybe they're not able to fall asleep or they have a lot of stress, which makes them uh, wake up in the middle of the night. According to mm -hmm. you, how serious a problem can dysbiosis be? It is um, it is an important uh, problem because uh, it leads to other issues. The first the symptoms, as we said, can be glass 
bloating, diarrhea, fatigue, impaired sleep, as you say. But uh, because this lining is impaired and we have a leaky gut, you have um, a situation in which this can degenerate in, in uh, chronic illnesses that are much more uh, dangerous or impairing if you want. Mm -hmm. So uh, when you obviously have um, a leaky gut, you have a proliferation already of pathogens in the body more easily because the gut lining is not tight anymore, is, in, is not impermeable, but becomes permeable. Uh, you can have situation like SIBO, which is a small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. You can have um, undigested food particles that go into the blood through this permeability and obviously this would um, uh, result in a in um, awakening of the immune system and uh, with the conditions like autoimmune conditions like uh, Hashimoto or um, or um, rheumatoid arthritis and uh, so um, we have other things what I'm trying to say is that this dysbiosis leads into an inflammation in the gut. When it is inflamed and you do not address it properly, it degenerates into uh, chronic uh, diseases. So uh, it is important to immediately bring down the inflammation and address this leakiness of the gut before it goes into the blood in the system and then into the brain as a leaky brain. And you were saying um, about, you mentioned about um, depression or anxiety or things like that. Those are signs that the leakiness of the gut has uh, um, has uh, um, reached actually the, the blood brain barrier and has provoked an inflammation there too. Okay. So it's very interesting because I was reading reports where there are blogs written by mothers uh, of children who have ADHD or children who are in the autistic uh, spectrum. And many of these mothers say that when they have looked at gut health, uh, improving the gut health, in improving or rather reducing the inflammation in the body, then the ADHD symptoms have reduced or the autistic spectrum of the child, you know, the scale has gone down. So gut health impacts everything. It impacts our cardiovascular system. It impacts our nervous system, which means the brain as well. Uh, it also, because a lot of people with gut health related issues do come back and say they have memory problems. Like they can't remember what they're supposed to do next. Uh, and um, most of us would not have thought that something as simple as just making sure we're having enough fiber and also having enough fermented foods, we would not have thought that this alone, I mean, this this simple thing is going to affect our health overall. The next thing I want to ask you, you've brought this up quite a few times about medication. I just wanted to ask you about antibiotic use, especially post COVID or during the three lockdowns of COVID, there has been such a rampant use in antibiotics. Uh, what is your take on medication, overuse of antibiotics? And the antibiotics are supposed to be used only when there is a bacteria um, uh, in infection. So, and there is a little bit of uh, an abuse there. I agree with you. Um, they impact the gut. Uh, we have seen that uh, um, taking a, even a course of antibiotics over six, seven, or 10 days, it impacts hugely uh, the microbiome, unfortunately. It, it is really decimated. And it is estimated that approximately 90% of the gut bacteria is killed while we take the antibiotics. Um, because antibiotics now, they are, are very often uh, prescribed with a large spectrum. So they just, you know, they, they kill everything, the pathogens and the, unfortunately, also our microbiome. Um, it is, it does grow back afterwards, after the series of uh, antibiotics, if a few measures are taken, like, you know, uh, supplementing with probiotic or eating probiotic foods, it grows back but it will never be the same as before. It uh, apparently from clinical studies, it takes up to six months even to grow back a normal, more diverse microbiome. Yeah. And uh, it is not as the one that we had before. Uh, it could be less diverse, for example. And um, and yeah, it is, uh, it is really something that we have to be aware of. With antibiotics cannot be 
taken like this lightly because they also impact negatively the gut. And uh, we have just discussed how important it is to have a healthy gut. So yeah, they should be taken really when it is absolutely necessary and life-saving. Because many times when uh, a person has viral fever, they'll, you know, they'll ask me, doc, why don't you put me on an antibiotic so that I get better fast? And uh, I do need to educate them about the difference between a viral infection and a bacterial infection and how, uh, you know, virus are not going to respond to antibiotics. Uh, but yeah. still, the, the mindset is always like, okay, go to a doctor, get an antibiotic and everything will be better. But if you let your body ride it out, go through the seven days of the viral fever, you will actually uh, thank your gut for helping you get through it, right? What about antacids? Like people go on to pan, uh, pantoprazole, omeprazole, uh, again, a lot of these, um, you know, uh, bismuth uh, liquids that are available. What about, what about things like that? Antiacids, they actually interfere with the balance of digestion. So they impact indirectly also the microbiome. And uh, um, I, yeah, I know of people, clients that they have a habit of taking antiacids before a big meal, disturbing the, the digestion that you have. And when you have a disturbed digestion, it impacts also the microbiome negatively. So um, instead of trying to decrease the acidity to be able to uh, to fight this uh, reflux that one has, it's absolutely more important to address the cause of the acidity and of the reflux because sometimes it's actually a lack lack of acidity in the stomach that is provoking this kind of reflux. Um, so um, the microbiome is also negatively impacted by the anti acids because, um, yeah, the digestion and the microbiome work together hand in hand. So if you want to act on one with a medication, it inevitably will impact the microbiome too. Okay. What about uh, colonics? I mean, even in traditional medicine, uh, clearing out the bowels, have, making the person have diarrhea for about two, two to three days so that, you know, all the, the belief is that all the toxins are removed. What is your uh, take on colonics? And even a lot of celebrities, a lot talk about uh, having, you know, going through a colonic every year and things like that. So what is your take on it? So I think that we are living with micro, micro, microbes and microorganisms everywhere on our skin, in our gut, on our body, in our environment. And this excessive sanitization that we do either in the house or even with our body, it's totally exaggerated and disrupts the microbiome because uh, we actually should be much more um, in, um, in uh, um, interaction with our environment, with nature, with microbes. Now, I'm not talking about uh, something that could be as dirt, maybe dirty surfaces that are, you know, on public spaces, but nature and environment and those things are filled with uh, bacteria and we need to interact with them because we they are part of us, actually. So trying to do these uh, colonics and wanting to wash everything away is just uh, doesn't make much sense for the health of the microbiome, actually. It's way too radical. In fact, uh, one of the reasons why gut health has uh, kind of become such a big issue is because today we over sterilize everything. We are washing our hands with soap every time. Then post COVID, everybody has become used to hand sanitizers. Uh, even if we pick up a pen, we need to go and wash our hands, right? That's what's taught to us before you go wash your hands, no matter what you're doing. Like you said, we need to first see the degree to which we have actually contaminated our hands with dirt before we think of using soap and water. Sometimes we can just wash our hands with water. That is more than enough. You don't need to use soap and sanitizers each and every time. Today, uh, in fact, even the vegetables, because of COVID, I see a lot of people washing the vegetables with chemicals. Uh, I think we've taken the sanitization a bit too far. Yes, completely. Um, if you have a, 
uh, a garden and you're picking your own vegetables so you don't need to wash your hands afterwards we are we need this interaction with those bacteria they are good bacteria and they feed our microbiome and it's the fact that we're breathing or that we're touching them and that we're not necessarily washing our hands that in the, that then feeds the microbiome that is in our gut so it is really unnecessary and a wrong uh, um, habit to to over clean and over sanitize as you were saying we have to differentiate what is really something that needs to be washed and something that doesn't need so what doesn't need to be washed is everything that is linked with a clean environment your garden and your vegetables a walk in the woods obviously taking a metro or a public transportation in the moment of covid it was necessary to protect oneself to wash our hands and to put a mask on because we were facing um these epidemics but now when we're talking about vegetables about with the contact of the environment the environment the nature that is it is considered dirty but it is actually clean it is clean for our bugs so we should not be sanitizing and cleaning and using chemicals to clean the the vegetable that's totally um, exaggerated yes so alex when we talk about the microbiome okay we are talking about fungi bacteria virus protozoa how do these enter our body they end well okay when we are in our mom's uh, belly we are totally sterile we enter in the contact with the microbiome from day one at our birth immediately so um just the contact with the environment is uh, feeding the microbiome. If we are born vaginally, we would take the mic, we are in contact directly with the microbiome that is present in the mom's vagina and in the mom's gut. Um, if we are born with a C-section, because this happens also quite often, then we would be in contact not so much with the bugs that are in the gut of the mom, but rather with the bugs that are on her skin, because we don't see them, but that we are covered with bacteria and microorganisms all, all over the place. So when we are born as a C-section, the first contact would be from the, um, if you want, ecosystem that is present on the skin of the nurses, of the mom, of the father, of the people that are present in the room. So that is the first contact. Uh, and this is how we start in life building a microbiome. This is really the first contact. And then, of course, food. Food, uh, when we are babies, it's milk. It could be mom's milk or it could be formula. If it is mom's milk, then we find antibodies in the milk. We find um uh, sugars and we find also my, the my, part of our microbiome if you want is already present oligosaccharides and are already present in the um, in the maternal milk so we are differently exposed uh, to a more diverse uh, composition microbiome composition when we are breastfed than when we are fed on a bottle and um, yeah so we start like this we start with birth and then we go on with milk you were talking about how important breast milk is also for populating the microbiome. In fact, it was interesting when we also came to know that human milk has something called as human milk oligosaccharides. In fact, the function of this as a complex sugar is just to feed the gut microbiome. That means even nature instinctively recognizes how important gut health is for the development of the brain, for the development of the nervous system, overall for the cardiovascular system and all of it. Right from birth, the body is being prepared to have good gut health. Exactly. There is bacteria in milk. There are these human milk oligosaccharides. There are even antibodies in 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 the in the milk that is uh, from for breastfeeding. And um, what is important it is that is the first years of life are really have a very important uh, role in educating our immune system. It is really really crucial and central. And as you said, human beings are well done. Nature is well done because the mom's milk is already providing the baby what is necessary to educate the immune system to protect it from uh, diseases and uh, pathogens uh, that uh, the baby will encounter in life so yeah nature is really well done yeah and in fact it's also interesting that the gut is where serotonin our feel-good hormone is uh, being manufactured our gut is where certain vitamins are being uh, produced like uh, vitamin k uh, and uh, also the gut is important for our immunity 
uh, yes, there is one extreme where if there's leaky gut, it can lead to autoimmune disorders, but good gut health is important for our immunity, right? Absolutely, because uh, as we said, um, first of all, uh, if it is not leak and it is uh, sealed, uh, it protects us from the external world because what we put in our mouth comes from the external wo world. So it does protect our body from pathogens or things that we don't want to enter our blood. And then it educates our immune system. And as you said, neurotransmitters are um, are secreted in the gut mainly. And serotonin, first of all, which is our feel-good neurotransmitter, and it's uh, extremely important to have it um, to uh, have a good secretion of neuro of serotonin in our gut because that also leads to melatonin and melatonin helps us put to sleep. So and serotonin is really a component of our mood. So it is absolutely important to have a healthy gut because as we see, everything is linked from the gut. So many things uh, stem out and uh, and lead to other organs or other uh, mood or other behaviors and other well being. So it's is really important to have a healthy gut yes and uh, suppose a person does have dysbiosis like they have bloating they have uh, indigestion or migraines if a person has symptoms of dysbiosis what can they do about it simple things that they can do in their day-to-day -day life first of all uh, i would advise them to try and un understand what triggers the inflammation in their gut? Because it has started with some kind of inflammation, the leakiness of the gut. So an inflammation very often is provoked, is triggered by foods that they are sensitive to. So it is trying to understand what foods work for them and what foods don't work for them. There are foods that are more inflammatory than others. So it's trying to really uh, point out to those ones. First of all, like for example, gluten or dairy or uh, processed sugars or soy, those are very inflammatory foods. And we have to try, the person has to try and understand if when they eat those foods, they have an immediate or a delayed reaction, which is so bloating, gas, diarrhea, constipation, and those kind of things. That's the first, first step is to try and listen to our body and understand if there is a, a category of food that is actually uh, provoking inflammation. Yes. Obviously, if that can be individualized, then the first thing is to take that food away temporarily to be able to, to bring down the inflammation. That mm -hmm. is number one. It's interesting what you're saying, because uh, the people that I was working with or coaching uh, with their you know dietary improvements, uh, those who I coached in October and November, and when they took a break in December, uh, and even early January, some of them came back and said, you know what, we need to get back onto this because just two to three days of eating a lot of pastries and sugar and I'm back to feeling bloated, I'm back to feeling anxious. Uh, I, I heard this in at least about three to four people who came back and said, I need to, you know, like uh, start this with you again. Sure. So the first thing that I do when I have a client coming with uh, digestive issues is what, to do what we call clean the muddy waters. So to clean the diet, in other words. Uh, so taking away the most inflammatory foods that are in the majority of people more inflammatory. So gluten, dairy and sugars. These have to be taken out immediately from the diet to see if this is enough and sufficient to bring down the inflammation they have and to resolve a little bit the digestive issue, or if we have to you know, dig a little further and try to um, understand with what other foods are actually inflammatory for them. The second step is trying to adopt a diet that is more uh, more appropriate. So introduce vegetables, introduce fruits, introduce home cooking, be at home and preparing cooking, smelling the, food, the, 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 the perfume of the food, using spices, taking the time to cook and to watch the food uh, being prepared helps our digestive enzymes to be secreted. It's a whole process in our body that starts going and that helps digestion because mm -hmm. Because buying a, a, a food that is already prepared in the street and just eating it fast as we walk, it's not letting our body get ready for digestion and digest properly. So these are very simple measures that are, make the whole, all the difference very often to certain people. Yeah. Cleaning a little bit the diet, again, gluten, dairy, and sugars, and taking the time to eat, sitting down mindfully, 
having home cooked things. Yes. And also while I started this video, I was talking about how the digestion starts right from the time you visualize the food. Like you said, there are enzymes that are released. Every time you smell the food, enzymes are released. So right from putting the food into your mouth till it is processed and all the waste products come out, it is all a process of digestion. And this has to be healthy in order for us to be healthy. Also, what I always say to, to my clients, start eating mindfully. Sit at a table. It takes 15 minutes, no more, to eat uh, you know, a portion, uh, a lunch or a meal. Close the screens. For 5-10 minutes, we can live without the phone and without the computer. If we eat while we watch something or we work, we don't even realize that we're eating. We don't leave the time to our body to digest, to secrete the, uh, the, the enzymes. And, and so we have to be mindful of what we're doing. Appreciate the food that we have in our plate. Eat it and chew it because digestion starts with chewing. When we watch a screen or we work or we talk on the phone, we just swallow. We don't even start chewing. And in the mouth, there is already the beginning of uh, of digestion, both with um, uh, the first uh, uh, lipase that is secreted and with the chewing. It's mechanical too. It's chemical and mechanical, the digestion in the mouth. So we have to allow it. We have to think at what we're doing calmly and honestly. 10, 15 minutes are more than enough to eat properly, calmly, chewing our meal, our food, and then we can go back to our screens uh, 10, 15 minutes or half an hour after. But uh, we really have to go back to the basics of chewing, of appreciating food, of cooking, of smelling, of letting our body get ready for digestion, as simple as that. I think our gut is also affected by a lot of toxins that are there in our environment. Uh, and we need to consciously try to go for things which are more organic, more natural, as far as possible, isn't it? Absolutely. Do we have to go back to local products and that in season and uh, that are not uh, sprayed with uh, chemicals? We can have to try and do our best trying to find things that are more natural, that are not, uh, you know, covered with toxic chemicals on the, on it. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely, so it's fundamental. Yeah, if a person does have dysbiosis and if they put all of this into place, now this is a challenge that I see with a lot of people. They want the bloating to go away overnight, or they want the gurgling in the stomach, or the dyspepsia, or the acidity to just go away overnight. Does it happen like that? How long does it take when these changes are put into place? Well, um, the first thing would be trying to understand what is uh, provoking the inflammation. So if uh, the person understands it quite rapidly and stops eating it, it can he can already feel an improvement within a week or 10 days because the bloating can come down. But a problem that has been installed in the gut for over years because this inflammation has been ongoing and the person has continued to live with that and manage somehow to accept it and to continue living, it cannot go away overnight and it does not go away overnight. You can have an improvement of the symptoms of the bloating if you stop eating the triggering food in even 10 days, but you know, you have not solved the situation. You have calmed down a little bit. It's I use always the image of a house. If the house is burning, it's not just enough a bucket of water. It is going to come down, of course. It is going to improve, but the house is burning. We really have to stop the fire in there. And then we have to build it back because the house is burned down. We have to be, be, build it back. And in the same way, when once we have brought down the inflammation, in the gut and we have removed what it is inflaming it we have to seal again this lining that we talked about the leaky gut needs to be built back to be healed otherwise uh, if you start eating again it's going to be inflamed again so it does take some time and you have to have patience and you have to be consistent and you have to really change and shift lifestyle it's not a question of okay i'm doing this for two three months and then i'll go back to my old diet because then it doesn't work that way unfortunately what what is your take on oral uh, probiotics it's so popular nowadays everybody seems to be wanting to take a probiotic to improve overall health to improve gut health what's your take on it 
So there are probiotics as supplements and probiotics as foods, right? So the probiotic foods are foods like kimchi, kombucha, yogurt, kefir, etc. And then you have the probiotics that are really in fashion now, as you were saying, that are as supplements. They are useful and they are not useful. Now, they're useful because obviously if you have an unhealthy and not sufficiently diverse gut, putting them in your in your in your system helps try to repopulate but you have to understand that they are actually transient these uh, microorganisms you will benefit from the supplementation when you take it not afterwards so it is it's not enough to just go and take supplements and think that it's going to be solved you have to repopulate your gut but before you have to bring down this inflammation and then repopulate your gut and then feed as we said your microorganisms so feed these probiotics they are live my microorganisms your probiotics contain live bacteria so when you take them you have to also after feed the bacteria that you have put in your gut. Otherwise, it's useless. They're transient and they will just go away. So yes. my take on them is that in certain situations, they do help. Uh, they are not the only solution and they're not 100% you know, sufficient solution. They help healing of a leaky gut but you one needs to do other things next to it you need to really change lifestyle change diet continue avoiding inflammatory foods and um, another thing that one should understand is that you can have them as i said through food and through food they are less transient they colonize the gut more easily Yes. But in a situation of poor digestion, you really cannot start feeding yourself with kombucha and fermented foods because you won't be able to digest them. So you have to start slowly and increase gradually. Yeah. So normally what I tell clients is like when you have kombucha, when you have uh, sauerkraut, for example, start with small amounts. Uh, don't don't drink a large amount of kefir and then expect your body to be able to adjust to it. You may have to start with just 10 to 20 ml and get used to it and allow that good bacteria to get in and colonize. So obviously, if you've had, uh, you know, a leaky gut for a long time, your body is not going to take so easily to the good things that you put into it as well. You have to build it with time. And uh, even if you do give yourself a, pro a commercially available probiotic, it's not going to magically uh, make all the symptoms disappear. It's still going to take the work from your side to eat right, to give enough fiber to the body along with all the fermented foods, right? Absolutely. It's a relief that one has um, uh, on, on the moment of the taking the supplement, but you cannot take supplement all the time because that then they wouldn't work anymore. So when you are on a situation of an infl inflamed gut, you remove what is inflaming or you try and identify it and you remove it, as I said before. And you can add the probiotics because those help, honestly, they help relieve the situation but it's temporary it's the question of a month not even three four weeks and while we do that we have to as you said start incorporating very very small quantities of a probiotic food because that is the real uh, source of a live microorganism that will be able to colonize the gut and uh, so yeah so it's a question of adapting gradually to to really probiotic food which is also cheaper which is extremely healthy and it which really colonizes the gut more easily and so but it has to be gradual because when has when a person has had a situation of inflammation and poor digestion those are quite hard to digest so they can be difficult we have to adapt to them gradually that's why i like to use the supplements at first a little bit for three four weeks and gradually shift to probiotic food to be able to really colonize the the gut but of course without it goes without saying that next to this intervention we need to have an appropriate diet rich in fiber otherwise again we have to feed them otherwise they won't stay can you give us some examples of uh, people who have come to you with dysbiosis and who you have managed to uh, treat successfully? I mean, what's any any examples that will help our listeners? Yes. 
Mm -hmm. uh, uh, one of the most uh, flagrant one was probably a lady that was suffering from migraines, but such bad migraines that she had to sh change work to reduce her time at work to 50%. And she was still absent half of the time of the month. So she was like 50% uh, employed and 50% of the time even absent still. And she was to a point in which she was taking medication through shots because the pills was, weren't helping her anymore. And um, yeah, so she came to me in batch shape in bad shape because also she she was having digestive issues and she had not made the link between her migraines and the health of her gut so we obviously started taking away inflammatory foods she started feeling better and gradually we uh, worked on the permeability of her gut with probiotics but uh, as we said supplements and then foods and then fiber in her diet because she didn't have very clean diet and a very diverse diet actually she was was really eating always the same foods rapidly at work under stress so we changed those kind of life habits and uh, yeah and I taught her to really start appreciating cooking and diversifying the diet and putting lots of vegetables in there to keep the probiotics so keep the the these microorganisms keep the bugs in the in the gut and um, her migraines just went down, down, down to the point that she stopped having the shots. And she's the last time I talked to her just to, you know, check on her and everything. She hadn't had migraines in two months. So wow. she went from one day out of two with migraines, unable to do anything on her in her bed to having them once in every two months. And we were still, you know, she's still work in progress. So the potential and the, the impact of the leaky gut on the gut and the inflammation is huge on our well-being. Yes. That's one of the, the, if you want, the most flagrant one. And um, I also had a, a very young lady that she came to me saying, oh, I can't digest anything. I'm, also, I'm allergic to meat. And uh, yeah, it was a question again of a huge inflammation that she had been feeding herself with uh, surrogate meats like soy non-ngo soy kind of uh, um, fake hamburgers and things like that and um, not a single vegetable not a single fresh food in her diet everything was bought from transformed uh, in plastic uh, just microwaved in the plastic container on the go like this and so I yeah I taught her to go back to the basics we have to think and go back to how our ancestors were eating and um, and feeding themselves. And she was having trouble. So I said, think at your great grandmother and tell yourself if your great grandmother wasn't eating that that way, then you probably should not. Yes. And that was the rule of thumb. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I'm amazed that you brought up about, you know, the vegetarian, non-veg uh, foods, because that is catching on so fast. And I keep trying to impress upon people that it's just processed food. And in, in fact, it may be more harmful than your regular burger, even because there's so much of heat and so much of uh, emulsifiers and everything put into it. It's just going to damage your system. In the, in the name of um, turning vegetarian, you don't start having artificial meat. It's just not going to do you any good. They had they contain a lot of um, uh, egg, um, savoring things like glutamate and things like that that give the the, the salty and the the, the 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 taste to it because uh, when you take soy or tofu it doesn't taste anything so they actually are putting chemicals and things like that into it to give it a proper taste that we enjoy and it's just a a, a piece of chemical in your in your in your dish so please no 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 you have wonderful proteins that are not animal if you want to be a vegetarian like lentils and chickpeas and um, beans and they uh, really have to switch to that and not to chemical and processed foods that are packed in plastics okay thank you alex it's been quite a good discussion and i hope that our listeners are going to benefit from this and uh, i hope to hear comments from our listeners because that's always going to be encouraging to us as well and I look forward to the next discussion with you. Pleasure, Nimi. And if your listeners have questions, uh, we are happy always to answer them. So looking forward to yes, some feedback. Thank you so much. So I hope this discussion with Alex has been helpful. 
And as always, I leave you with this message. Remember that wellness begins with your weight.